Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about the story and controversies of the Missing Children Milk Carton Program. Even if you've never heard of this program, you're probably familiar with its objective, which was putting the photographs of missing children on milk cartons across the United States. The program, which began in the 1980s, was meant to raise public awareness about the epidemic of missing children and more broadly the concept of stranger danger. While the program's effects have been very widespread, and there's at least a couple success stories from the program, including a very bizarre instance that we're going to talk about today, many remembered the Milk Carton Kids for the eventual controversy and downfall that the program would acquire. And if you've ever seen a picture from a movie or TV show that shows a missing kid on the side of a milk carton and wonder, huh, why don't they do that anymore? We're going to talk about exactly why they don't do that anymore. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around as we talk about the problems, cases, and history of the Missing Children Milk Carton Program, which will almost undoubtedly be useless information to everyone watching, but it will also be depressing for whatever that's worth. But before I fill your brain with more useless, depressing knowledge, let's talk about something that's neither useless nor depressing, like today's sponsor, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is the low-carb, keto-friendly breakfast that's gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free as well. But not only that, Magic Spoon also has 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only 4 net grams of carbs, and only 140 calories per serving. And if you hear all that and think, what's the big deal? Then you clearly haven't tried Magic Spoon, or seen my previous ads, because you'll know that the most magical thing about this cereal is that it tastes amazing too. As a matter of fact, last time we talked, I was on a hunt to find the source of Magic Spoon's hidden power. And since then, I have gone on a hunt for Magic Spoon itself, and around me you can see my war trophy, I mean, um, participants in today's ad. And while it's true that those you see around you have been mercilessly hunted by yours truly, if you think about it, that's really Magic Spoon, the company's fault. See, they send me about a dozen cereal boxes a month to do these ads, but if they think that a dozen was enough to satisfy me, then they clearly haven't tried their own breakfast, because once I start, I can't stop. So Magic Spoon forced my hand, and I had to begin sourcing my supply from the local wildlife. But I can assure you that everything you see before you now has been ethically sourced, has been ethically sourced, and is really the cereal's fault for being so delicious. So if you're like me and want to get in on this fantastic breakfast option without committing the sins that I will one day tell God about, then you can do that by going to the link in the description at magicspoon.com forward slash windagoon to get your Magic Spoon order for $5 off. That is right, you can get $5 off your order at the link in the description. If you're looking for some recommendations, some of my favorite are the chocolate chip cookie, the s'mores, the cinnamon roll, and the fruity, although you really can't go wrong with any pick. Again, that's magicspoon.com forward slash windagoon to get in on this deal today. Thank you all so much for watching the ad. Thank you so much to those who witnessed these crimes and didn't alert the authorities. And thank you so much to Magic Spoon for sponsoring the video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description. And we are... I made the Tower of Cereal, and if I don't knock it over, people will be mad, so... And we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Also, before we get started, check this out. My buddy Bryant made the Windagoon logo into a real thing, like with the night vision mount and the deer skull. It's like Windagoon, but real. He's so cool. I'm going to make sure he stays somewhere on this wall for the foreseeable future. So thank you, Bryant. Now to understand how the Missing Children Milk Carton Program came to be, we need to take a look back at the first instance of someone putting a kid's face on a milk carton. And to do that, we need to understand how the whole milk carton thing worked. In the 1960s, paper milk cartons became the main form of milk distribution in order to replace the more expensive glass bottles. Since these paper milk cartons were cheap and pretty quickly produced with a wide audience, it became common for companies near local dairies to advertise on the side of milk cartons. So by the 1980s, it was very common to expect some kind of messaging or advertisement on the side of the milk carton you buy at the grocery store. Now, strangely, there's a lot of debate online as to which child was the first to show up on a milk carton, 
but I think I found the correct timeline of events. In Des Moines, Iowa, on September the 5th, 1982, a paperboy by the name of Johnny Gosh went missing. Johnny was 12 years old at the time, and every morning, Johnny and his father would ride around the neighborhood as Johnny rode on his bike and his father followed him, as Johnny would throw newspapers to all the houses on the street. The night before Johnny went missing, he told his father that he felt he was old enough to do the paper run on his own. His father said no and told Johnny to wake him up before he does the morning route. But it seems that the next morning, again September the 5th, Johnny didn't wake his father and instead took his bicycle and red wagon full of newspapers around the block by himself. People around the neighborhood began to call the paper company saying that their paper hadn't come that morning and after Johnny's father went looking for him, he found his son's red wagon and bicycle tipped over two blocks away from their house. During the investigation, a neighbor had said that they had seen Johnny talking to someone in a truck while Johnny was still on his bicycle, but according to that witness, it just seemed he was asking the guy for directions and the two parted ways. Beyond that, no clues as to Johnny's disappearance were ever discovered. This disappearance was a big deal and stayed in the public conscious for the next couple years, especially when a similar disappearance occurred in 1984. On August the 12th of 1984, a month shy of being two years exactly from Johnny's disappearance, another paper boy, this one Eugene Martin, also went missing in Des Moines, Iowa. Eugene's case was very similar to Johnny's. Eugene was 13 years old and had gone out to do the paper route that morning and was never seen again. A witness came forward and said that, very similar to Johnny's case, Eugene was spotted talking to an unknown man at around 5.45 in the morning. This was the only information the public had to go on, and given the similarities between Eugene and Johnny's case, many of the locals believed that the two disappearances were linked. However, what happened immediately following Eugene's disappearance, that didn't happen following Johnny's disappearance, would change the concept of missing children in the United States forever. Eugene Martin had a relative who worked at the local Anderson and Erickson Dairy. Again, the disappearance of Johnny and Eugene was a huge deal in Des Moines, and Eugene's relative felt that if people knew what the kids looked like, then they'd have a better chance of finding them. So Eugene's relative approached his boss at the Anderson and Erickson Dairy and said, what if, instead of running the normal ads that we run every week, we instead put pictures of Johnny and Eugene on the side of our milk cartons? The owner of the dairy thought this was a great idea, and in September of 1984, for the first time, photos of missing children with the word missing rolled out in grocery stores across the city. And from there, the concept spread really fast. A couple months later, in November of 1984, Walter Woodbury of the much larger Hawthorne Melody Dairy in Whitewater, Wisconsin, was visiting Des Moines, Iowa on a business trip. While in Des Moines, he saw one of the Anderson and Erickson milk cartons that had the faces of two missing kids printed on the side of it and thought it was an incredible idea. The Hawthorne Melody Dairy was so big that part of its distribution range was Chicago, Illinois. So, Woodbury goes to the police chief of the Chicago Police Department, tells him about his idea to put missing kids on milk cartons, and the Chicago police also thought that it was a great idea. So it begins to spread to newspapers around the country that Chicago is going to begin showcasing missing children on milk cartons to raise public awareness. A month later, in December of 1984, Stephen Glazier, the future senator of California, sees this in the paper and thinks it would be a great idea for the entire state of California. So a statewide campaign is launched in California, and nearly every large dairy in the state begins putting missing children on the side of milk cartons. So seeing this as a way to raise awareness for missing kids, the newly formed National Child Safety Council creates a new program that will be nationwide and use a database of missing children to be printed on milk cartons across the country. And this program was called the Missing Children Milk Carton Program, founded in December of 1984. The first child featured on a milk carton at a national level was Eden Patz. Now Eden's disappearance predates that of Johnny and Eugene's, however Eden's case became much more high profile. On May the 25th of 1979, a six-year-old Eden Patz went missing from his neighborhood in Lower Manhattan. Normally, Eden's dad would walk him down the short stretch of sidewalk in front of their house to get to the corner of the street where Eden's school bus would stop every morning. 
This morning of May the 25th, Eden was excited because it was the first time he got to walk to the school bus alone. However, after leaving his front door to take the short walk of a few dozen feet to the bus stop at the corner of his street, Eden was never seen again. Whenever Eden didn't show up for school that day, the teacher just assumed he was sick and didn't think to call it in to the principal or his parents. It wasn't until that evening when Eden didn't come home from school that the parents decided to call the school, only to figure out that he had never been there, and then call the police. Despite over 100 police officers, a team of bloodhounds, and nearly the entire neighborhood searching for him, Eden was never found. The case was so high profile that Ronald Reagan made May the 25th National Missing Children's Day. And despite the Missing Children Milk Carton program beginning five years after Eden's disappearance, Eden Pats was seen as such a widely known case and a case that people wanted to see resolved in some sense that they decided his would be the first face to show around the country. There's a lot of confusion and conflicting reports online as to which face was the first to appear on a milk carton. Some say it was Johnny's, some say it was Eugene's, and some say it was Eden's. But as I just explained, all three are technically correct. Johnny and Eugene appeared simultaneously as the first kids on a milk carton, and Eden was the first one to appear nationally on a milk carton. By March of 1985, the program was widely adopted, with 700 out of 1,800 dairies in the country being a part of the initiative. And according to the National Child Safety Council, in April of 1985, sightings of missing children had increased by 30%. However, sightings of missing children are very different from children no longer missing. And if you're hearing all of this and asking yourself, so how effective was the Missing Children Milk Carton Program? Then, well, now it should also be mentioned that the faces of missing kids weren't exclusive to milk cartons. There were also cases of the faces appearing on envelopes, trucks, billboards, grocery bags, pizza boxes, and even utility bills. So the question, whenever you have all of these different avenues for people to see children's faces, is, are they actually working? And it seems that the end result is, we don't know. Of course, there was the odd circumstance where a child was found and a witness would say that they saw the kid's face on a pizza box or milk carton, but those were few and far between. Even by the most generous estimates, like the National Child Safety Council saying that sightings of children increased by 30%, which is again, from the people who are hosting the program, a 30% increase in sightings doesn't mean a lot unless there's a relatable number of children recovered. Some of the only numbers we have for how the program performed, at least relating to milk cartons, are from the days whenever the program was just starting to take off. Like, for example, a report by the LA Times in 1985, whenever California was one of the first states to adopt the program. In the first few months of the program in LA, the LA Times said that out of the 14 children who were shown on a milk carton, seven of them have been returned home. And while you may hear that and think, oh, well, 50%, that's pretty good, hold on. That's assuming that all seven of these children were returned home because of the effect of the milk carton, when it turns out only one of them was, and even then it's just kind of. All seven of these children were not abducted, rather they were runaways. And in each case, it seems that it was an older child, 14 to 17 years old, who decided to run out and party with friends for a week or two, and then came back home. And during that time they were gone, the parents called the police, the police filed them as a missing child, so their face wound up on a milk carton when they were really just out on a bender. The one out of the seven kids who were equated to the milk carton program said that they were gone for a few days and saw their face on the news and their face on a milk carton and decided to come back home. But even then, from everything I read, it seemed that the kid was just out partying for a week. They didn't like move out. But the news just simply said 50% success rate and that made more people decide to get on board the program. And it seems that across the country, numbers were fudged in a very similar manner. One of the statistics I kept hearing from politicians and law enforcement around this time was the 2 million number, saying every year 2 million children go missing, which is an insane estimate by anyone's standards. 
But the narrative, even if it was never officially stated around this entire culture of the 80s, and especially the stranger danger epidemic, which is something that's a bit out of the scope of this video, was that all two million of these missing kids were abducted and sweeped off the streets by these no good, low down strangers who roll into town, steal a few kids, then roll out. And it began to contribute to this air of fear in the public that you couldn't let your child out in public, even if you were with them, because there was always a shady van around the corner ready to sweep up kids. And I'm sure that several of you watching either lived through or had parents who lived through the era of anti-stranger PSAs or these videos that would teach children to never get in a car unless they had a password that your parent would have told them at some point and to never talk to weird people at the grocery store and all kinds of stuff like that. And while that's not bad in itself, of course, everyone and their children should be prepared for bad people, it was an insane mischaracterization of the statistic. For one, the 2 million number seems completely bloated. By most estimates I've seen, the 1.8 to 2 million figure is people throughout the year who told the police, maybe, that their child was kidnapped, and less than half of those turn out to be legitimate. It's just parents who lost their kid in the grocery store for like two minutes. And according to a Department of Justice survey from around this time, out of all of the reported kidnappings, they could confirm 800,000 as abductions that police looked into. And you may hear them think, 800,000, that's still a wild number. Well, out of that 800,000, the Department of Justice said that 115 of those were stereotypical abductions. And by stereotypical abduction, I mean a scenario in which a stranger transported a child and kept them overnight. So 115 out of 800,000? Not a lot. Of course, it's still a tragedy and still 115 too many, but compared to the population of the United States, that is a very small number. The vast majority of missing children's cases are either children running away or divorce disputes or specifically cases during a divorce where one parent is given custody for an allotted time and the other parent either takes the child away for some time or picks up the kid when they're not supposed to and it causes a spat where one party calls the police. The issue was all of these cases, even cases of children running away for a day or two then coming back home, were getting lumped in as missing children. And the issue with that is that it went on to define an entire era of child rearing. There was an entire generation of kids who had their neighborhood shut down Halloween for fear of all of the random unmarked vans that they feared were ready to pick up their children. And there were schools who would shut down sporting activities and not allow the children to play outside for fear of all of the strangers who could be lurking in the bushes. So rather comically, there would be a lot of scenarios where a family would buy a milk carton that had a missing kid on it and then the parent would set down the kids and be like, all right, now to make sure you don't wind up like Billy here, make sure you do X, Y, Z. When it turns out Billy just went and stayed at a friend's house for a few days <laughs> before coming back, and now the parent's telling their kids about human trafficking rings. That led to another aspect of the milk carton program that quickly fell out of public favor, and that was the fact that if any family bought milk, which was most families in the United States, the missing child was now a centerpiece at their morning breakfast. And this effect was twofold. For the adults who saw a different child's face every time they went to the supermarket, they became desensitized to the kids they were seeing and stopped thinking about the intent of the program, which was to look for this specific child. Whereas the children who were sitting next to a child their age every morning with the words, have you seen me or missing across it, became more and more terrified. Pediatricians Benjamin Spock and T. Barry Brazelton were very open critics of the milk carton program because they said they had seen several children who developed this acute sense of paranoia after seeing so many faces of kids their age 
on these missing person cartons. And again, this would be fine if the milk carton program was saving children. I think we can all agree that the life of a child is more important than the comfort of another child. But as mentioned, it was debated if the milk carton program was doing any good at all, other than scaring kids and just vaguely raising the idea of stranger danger. A lot of the language and practices I see around this time seem like an overcorrection for me. In the 50s and 60s, children just kind of went missing and either from runaways or just going off with strangers and people just kind of let it slip. So in the 80s, there was this massive course correction where any statistic that had to do with a kid not being at home at night was added on to scare all the other children into never talking to anyone ever. <laughs> what also didn't help was the juxtaposition between the milk carton program and the nature of missing children. See, there were several cases of people thinking that the milk carton program was a good idea, and pretty much across the board in the beginning, everyone thought it was a good idea. Uh, until, you know, children started to get scared of anyone taller than them, but that's different. Um, but there was this period of time where people really liked the idea. And every time that they would see a new child's face, they'd sit down with the family and be like, okay, this kid is Bobby Lawton. And he looks like this, he's about your height, so if any of us see Bobby, make sure to tell a police officer. And it was a good, it was doing what the program was supposed to. It was getting families thinking about this missing child. And especially with some of the language I've seen around it, politicians had this weird Timmy stuck in the well mentality. Like, oh, these kids just got away from home, let's go get them. So people kind of got blindsided by, you know, the nature of missing children. Because I probably don't have to tell you, but even in the modern age with tech and search equipment being as great as it is, if a child is kidnapped or even gone out of their house for more than 48 hours, the chances of finding them alive are not great. As a matter of fact, the majority of child murders happen shortly after the initial abduction. And the time it takes for an investigation where the police are called, they do a search, they file the child as missing, and then a local dairy hears about it, gets a picture of the child, and then puts it out to be printed on their milk cartons and then distributed in stores. Not a good time frame. So while near the end of the program, like I mentioned, a lot of the faces on milk cartons weren't really missing children, they were just children who were filed as missing for one reason or the other, even in the beginning, when it was like these high-profile missing children cases, by the time that face got to the dinner table, the chances of that kid being found weren't good. So it created this atmosphere where families would all invest themselves into this child, and then either through the news or talking to the police, it would be like, oh, well, what happened to old Timmy? And the police would be like, oh, his, um, his remains were found in the forest outside of town he'd been there for weeks it seems oh what 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 about little sally well it seems that sally was kidnapped by a human trafficking ring and uh there's really no lead on the killer she's probably out of the country at this point oh and then that guy has to go home and tell his family that and then another kid shows up on a milk carton and that cycle continues until everyone's tired of seeing it. So once again, public favor began to fall. And while I've talked about a lot of the problems with the Missing Children Milk Carton program, it wasn't without its success stories either, including one of the most bizarre, crazy child abduction cases ever, which was that of Bonnie Lohman. When Bonnie was three years old, she was kidnapped from her father by her mother. Bonnie's mother and stepfather spent the next couple years living in Saipan and Hawaii with Bonnie, hoping that they would eventually lose heat from the police as they had just kidnapped a child. Eventually, they moved to Colorado around the time that Bonnie is seven years old. At this point, because again, Bonnie was a kidnapped child, she hadn't been enrolled in school or allowed to talk to really anyone outside of her mother and stepfather. But in Colorado, Bonnie began to make friends with the neighbors next door, and her father even took her out to town on rare occasion. On one of these occasions, they were walking through a grocery store, and Bonnie looked in the dairy aisle to see her own face on a milk carton. 
Now, since Bonnie was never placed in school, she wasn't able to read and didn't know that just above her face was the word missing. Bonnie was a child and just saw her face on a milk carton and thought it was weird. And in one account I heard from Bonnie, apparently her stepfather introduced the picture to her. Like they were walking through the grocery store and he's like, oh, would you look at this? Here's your face. Like talk about overconfidence. So the stepfather bought the milk carton because Bonnie thought it was neat. And after they finished the milk, he let her cut out her own picture on the side of the milk carton and keep it. So Bonnie would just play with the picture of herself on the milk carton because she thought it was neat. And one day she had left it in a box full of Barbie toys that she had taken over to her friend's house. And after leaving that box at her friend's house, her friend's parents opened it saw the picture of Bonnie with the word missing above it, called the police, the police came and arrest Bonnie's mother and stepfather and returned Bonnie back to her dad. And that is, at least to my knowledge, the one time that a child's face on the side of a milk carton 100% directly led to the rescue of the child. And again, there were other cases of people saying that a child was saved because someone had recognized the picture from a milk carton, but Bonnie's the time that the milk carton did the heavy lifting. Can you imagine the bizarre nature of that, of seeing your own picture on a milk carton and then getting older and realizing what that meant? Like what a, what a bizarre moment in history. But again, cases like this were few and far between and most people continue to build criticism for the campaign as a whole. Another large criticism of the campaign was that the children featured on the side of milk cartons were overwhelmingly white, and normally whenever a minority child was shown on the side of a milk carton, it was a local program rather than a national program. So as you could imagine, people didn't take too kindly to that. And it seems as the program went on, like I mentioned, it went from high profile missing persons cases to just a series of cases where children were reported missing, with a lot of them just being spousal disagreements or runaways. And like with those later cases, the police, the judge, and everyone knows that the parents got into a fight, and one of them took the kid for a bit, and they're going to go to court, and everyone knows where the kid's at, so that person doesn't need random do-gooders stopping them on the street because they saw the kid's face on a milk carton. And a lot of people seem kind of stumped by why the quality of, that's a weird way to say it, the quality, why the requirements for missing children kind of dissolved over time. But I think there's a pretty easy explanation. Adam Garfinkel, a historian, notes that over the years, the government began to offer tax breaks to dairies who would feature kids' faces on the side of them because it was seen as a public service. Which means in the later years of this program, the more kids you show on a milk carton, the more you can get taken off your taxes. So I think I know why they quit caring. <laughs> it also didn't help that a lot of the poster child cases for the milk carton program did not have happy endings. For example, Eden Pats, the first one who was shown nationally, was never found. And several of the details around the case are very grisly. Uh, initially, there was a suspect who was arrested and questioned, who was a serial child abuser, uh, but then they can never get anything on him. And then in 2017, someone else confessed to killing Eaton and went to jail, but then the validity of the confession has been called into question. Eugene Martin was never found and there was never a lead in the case other than the person he talked to that morning in 1984. And Johnny Gorsh's case is particularly bizarre. In 1999, Again, there had been no lead in Johnny Gorsh's case. He was the one who his dad found the wagon with the papers in it uh, that morning in 1982. And from 1982 to 1999, there were no substantial leads in the case. Until in 1999, Johnny's mother said just in a conference one day that in 1997, two grown men showed up at her house and one of them claimed to be Johnny. She said that Johnny had a very specific birthmark on his chest, so she checked his chest, and sure enough, it was Johnny. So Johnny comes into her house, and they talk for an hour, where Johnny explains that he was kidnapped by a ring of human traffickers, and here, about 20 years later, 
had just now gotten out and likely would never see his mom again as he is still in hiding from the traffickers. The police investigated her claims, could never find any leads. Someone came out saying that they knew Johnny because they were also kidnapped by that same ring of traffickers, but then that guy turned out to be lying. And a lot of people think that Johnny's mom just had a bit of a mental break and made the story up. And then in 2006, Johnny's mom came forward again, this time with a photograph that was left on her doorstep that depicted three men tied up and gagged, and one of them, according to her, was Johnny, now grown up. However, a police officer in Florida said that he knew the picture because a similar thing happened in the 1970s when the picture came across his desk as being a group of kidnapped people. So the police officer looked into the case and was able to track down all the men in the photograph and found out that it was just a willing photograph that the three men took. And it seems that in 2006, someone played a very sick prank on Johnny's mom by reusing the photograph, making her think that it was her own son. So that goes to say a lot of these cases, even the high profile ones that the media would use as a benchmark, left people feeling more disturbed than encouraged. So between the debatable overall impact, the false attribution of missing children, the terror it caused both adults and children, the non-reporting of minority missing persons cases, and allegations that stem from tax breaks given to dairies, you can probably see why the program quit. The final nail in the coffin for the Missing Children Milk Carton program came in 1996 with the invention of Amber Alert. The Amber Alert program, which is something I've talked about and you're probably familiar with, allows the authorities to give real-time updates on the children, descriptions of the children, and descriptions of their captors and the vehicle they're using. Amber Alert allows people to have real-time updates, especially in that first crucial period of time after the child goes missing, in a way that the milk carton program never could. And similar modern advancements in technology have allowed much better chances for children that go missing. For example, in 1990, about 62% of missing children were found alive and well, whereas in 2011, 97% of children were successfully recovered. An Amber Alert seems to have a significant part in that factor, as in a 2022 survey, 1,114 successful recoveries have occurred because of Amber Alert. And while I've talked about a lot of the controversies surrounding the milk carton program today, I truly believe that in the beginning and throughout all of it, there was at least a remnant of good faith people looking to help kids. In the beginning, it was entirely done out of the kindness of people's hearts. And the fact that 700 dairy plants around the United States took a cut of their profit, because remember, the kid occupies a space that an ad normally would, the fact that they did that, and by some estimates printed a total of over 5 billion milk cartons with missing children's faces, says a lot. And yes, numbers were bloated to incite public panic, and once tax breaks became involved, it became a whole business decision, but at least in the beginning, it was just people looking to help kids. While the milk carton program would slowly fade out in the years following the invention of Amber Alert in 1996, many believe Molly Bish in 2000 to be the last child ever featured on a milk carton. And sadly, as with many children featured on milk cartons, her body would be found three years later. I think the milk carton program is fascinating because again, it comes from a time whenever people began to overcorrect for the frankly negligence that children received. Up until things like the missing children milk carton program and the National Child Safety Council, there was no way to distinguish a missing adult from a missing child. And nowadays it seems ridiculous because the rules are completely changed, rules for searching and information are completely changed, but at the time it was just treated the same across the board. And things like the Missing Children Milk Carton Program began to bring the concept of missing children into the public conscious to a degree that it eventually led to changes across the board. And had it not been for that program, things like Amber Alert, and modern rules dictating how searches can be done and how quickly searches can be done for missing children never would have happened. So even if the program devolved to a point where it kind of lost track of what it originally was and there was a lot of controversy that it scared kids and led the public wrong, 
I still think it was an overall good because when I look at figures like 1,114 children saved because of Amber Alert, that number never would have happened if it wasn't for the faces of Eugene Martin and Johnny Gorsh showing up on a Des Moines milk carton in 1984 that set all of it in motion. And I also think it's interesting to learn about because there was an entire generation of people who their childhood before school was growing up and looking at the face of a child they probably never knew, but now would be ingrained in their mind forever as the missing kid who ate breakfast with them every day. It's such a bizarre and weird moment in history to think about. And again, one that I think was necessary, but almost has this macabre nature whenever we look back on it. And I think it's fascinating. And if you stuck around this long in the video, hopefully you think it's fascinating too. And see, I told you it would be depressing. And even if it was depressing, I'm still glad you're here and stuck around this long. And it means the most to me. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Thank you all so much for sticking around. This is a weird topic, I know, but I guess that's kind of like the, you know, tagline for the channel at this point, just weird stuff. Um, I was watching a YouTube video where someone was talking about old cartoons and how they used to make jokes out of people on milk cartons. And I was like, I bet there's some weird history to that. And sure enough, I start researching and find all these, uh, like the tax break stuff and people complaining that... Um, it was scaring kids and all of that. And uh, I, I was like, aha, I was right. There is weird stuff. So I had to immediately tell you all. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed the video. Uh, it's something I don't think it's talked about a lot. There's a few other YouTube videos I watched on the topic that were pretty good. Uh, but I wanted to bring it to you guys and hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think this kind of stuff's fascinating. Like just these weird little footnotes in history. Because when you look at it in the scheme of like, you know, modern police investigations, even missing children, it's just kind of a footnote, right? It's like, oh, for a while we put kids on milk cartons. But when you think about the implications of that and like the logistics of it, it's so wild and the way it was marketed to people, I think it's fascinating, but you've heard enough about that at this point. Uh, but again, thank you all so much for watching. Um, this will be my first video in, what month is it? November, yes, <laughs> very tired. This will be my first video in November. Um, I have some big plans I don't want to give too much yet. There will be another cool video coming out December. Hopefully you all enjoyed the uh, the Brown Mountain Lights video I did. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, so hopefully December there should be something cool. And also in December we will be shooting the Stalker film. Again, thank you all so much for the support you've shown on that. Uh, there, I know it's been kind of radio quiet for a while. Radio quiet. Radio, radio silent for a while about a lot of the merch and gear. Uh, I assure you that every day we are working to get the props and the supplies and the casting and all that. Uh, and we're on track to shoot for December. And um, re really thank you all so much for allowing this to happen. I can't wait to show you all what we have in store. So during December, expect maybe some live streams for me or some like maybe a video on the second channel, which is again, Winda Gang linked in the description of me on set talking about it. Um, I think you all will enjoy, I, I really hope you all enjoy the movie, but I think you'll enjoy some of my like BTS content too. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and I have some, I have some cool video topics coming your way that if you like weird stuff, you'll hopefully like them. Um, but again, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for being here. It means the world. I believe that should do it for now, but I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. I will see you in the next one.